Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Richie Clendenin. I'm the senior pastor here at Christian Fellowship Ministries. And I'd like to take a moment to personally thank you for joining us in our service time together today. Christian Fellowship has been a staple in our community and has been a wonderful gathering of, of Christ lovers from all around the region. It's a place where you can come and receive. It's a place where you can come and hear God's word as we corporately worship the name of our King together. If you're looking for a family, you, ha you don't have to look any further because we would love to have you come and join us here in service. And if you can't be here in person, then please feel free to continue to join us in our broadcast. God bless you. Sit back and let's open God's word and study his word together. I want us to pray corporately now the prayer that I just said we're going to pray. And won't you just repeat this after me as we approach the word of God. Jesus, I pray that you help me understand your word, that you help us focus on your word, that you give us the wisdom to obey your word, and you help us to understand who you are and what I have because of your word. Open your Bibles, if you would, to first John, uh, to John, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 1. We started this series, and if you weren't here last week or didn't get to hear the sermon, what we are doing is we are moving through the book of John, and you are here on week 1. We did the introduction, and uh, we read our theme verse, and that's going to be our theme verse throughout this entire book, which is found in John chapter 20. He said, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. And I feel like I am under a mandate from the Lord uh, that he spoke to me on sabbatical that this is what we are supposed to do, that we're going to traverse through this book asking these two questions. Who is Jesus and what do I have because of that fact? We're seeking to understand Jesus is the Christ, and we're seeking the life that comes because of our belief in that fact. So I want you to think about that as we read these first 18 verses of John chapter 1. Who is Jesus, and what do we have because of that? John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Praise the Lord. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. By the way, it's not the same John. That's the John of the author of this book. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, and all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and to his people, and they did not receive him. But all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. I can't even see the pages because of the tears running down my face. Full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Let me say before we get into this passage, there is a 0% chance that we can dissect the fullness of the truths in these 18 verses 
in one simple sermon. It's not going to happen. Honestly, we could do a year series on this passage alone. It's vast. It's chock full of nuggets. But we're going to learn together. I'm going to share what God spoke to me, but I want to ask because we are discovering him together. I feel like far too often in church life, there's somebody up here that's telling you something. But that's not my heart. It's not my view. We learn together. And if you ever come on Wednesday nights and sometimes on Sundays, uh, we'll, I'll ask questions. And I, I just want to ask, as you studied this this week, as you read this this week with your families, I, I want to hear the discussions that you had and what God illuminated to you. And I know that's a big ask, but trust me, I do this every week in front of people. They're not as mean as you think they are. They'll give you grace. Who, who wants to start? What, what's something that you learned this week through this passage? Anybody? Greg? We're not just servants. We've been brought in as kids. That's really, really good. Who, who else? I know we had a lot of hands that said I read this this week, and I know. Go ahead, Dale. In the book of Genesis. I've heard that comment a lot this week. Uh, there is a, Jared, is it you that's teaching out of Genesis in the community? And uh, Somebody that was in that group said, man, that's amazing that we heard that same phrase in Genesis and in John. That's really good. Who, who, who else? What is it you learned this week from John chapter 1? Go ahead, Sarah. <clears throat> Mm. that's a very good theological truth we're going to dig into here in a little bit. The past and the present form uh, are both present in that text. That's a really good, insightful point. H who else? What's Go ahead, Paul. <clears throat> that's so good that's so so good hey amen who else i'm enjoying this ed mm -hmm. that's really good there's no grace in the law i saw a hand over here Let's hear somebody from this side. Anybody. I'm not going to put it. Go ahead, Trey. He's the light. Very good, son. Go ahead, Phil. Amen. That's, that's a true immutable fact of physics. When light encounters darkness, guess who wins? Light. Uh, darkness can't overcome light. Any, anybody else? Go ahead, Greg. Amen. That's really good. I want to share what the Lord has laid on my heart from this passage. And once again, this is not an exhaustive list of this passage. The first thing I see is Christianity is Jesus Christ. I mean, there is no Christianity without Christ. And not just in the spelling of the word, in our faith itself, you remove Christ. It's not that we're just in pursuit of God, the, Fa the Father. There is no Christianity apart from the person of Jesus. And, and what I get by that, you can actually remove Buddha from Buddhism and it, it remains. Did you know that? Yeah, you can remove Muhammad from Islam and you still have a faith, but you can't take Christ out of Christianity or it won't stand. Christianity is the person of Jesus Christ. So he's infinite 
There's no way that we can exhaust in one sermon the, de- the doctrine of Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, he is the main theme in every single part of this book. Now, some of it is very overt, and that's what John was telling us. I'm going to be overt in my writing to let you know that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of God. Some of it, you have to dig in and study and find Christ, but he's there. The whole book is... And it's a theological term. It's Christocentric. He's the center of the Bible. Our focus today is on his essence and in his nature. And I want to talk about a few doctrines. And I don't want to get super academic, but it's very important to the keys of our faith. So let's ask the first question. Who is Jesus? The first thing that I see in verse 1 in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if you're following along, these notes are in the YouVersion Bible app. And uh, if you are kind of slow in taking notes, that's okay. Go to that and all of them are there. The first point that I see is his divinity. Would you say that with me, his divinity? What does his divinity mean? Uh, it's very overt here. It's, it's just very intentional. It's not that Jesus is a form of God or subservient to God. Jesus himself is God. And and that's very important for us to get a hold of. That when Jesus came, and we're going to talk about this point in a minute, but when he came to earth, it wasn't that God had to send somebody to save us. Jesus himself is God. In in other words, God himself came to us. And, And that's very important that we get a hold of. That Jesus himself is God. And I want to tell you, it's that line that is the line of demarcation between Christianity and cult. If someone denies the deity of Jesus Christ, they are not a brother. They are a target for evangelism. And, and there's a lot of that stuff out there. As a matter of fact, 1 John 4, 3 says, every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is from God. He says that's the spirit of of antichrist you've heard that's coming and it's already here there's a lot of people and a lot of them are door knockers that come to your house they'll knock on the door and they'll want to tell you about jesus and and i'm like great i'd love to have a conversation about jesus what jesus are you talking about and and if you want to see them hightail it the other direction which i don't i want to see them know jesus Change the subject because what I say is, now, are we talking about the same Jesus? Because the Jesus I want to talk about is is God in human flesh. He is God. He's the Son of God that came incarnate, and he died for you and me. And all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And they stop. That right there, my friend, is the line of demarcation between a cult and the true faith. When someone comes to your door and they want to talk to you about Jesus, they come to you in the workplace, they want to talk to you about Jesus, it's essential that you draw that line because if you don't have that line, there is no basis of fellowship or discussion. Everybody hear me on that? It's important we get that because there's a lot of things that we can disagree with. A lot of us in this building disagree. I know that's a shocker in church. A lot of us disagree with how the church does it down the road. We can disagree about how we do church. Some people may disagree with the fact that I had other people do some teaching today. What did you learn? You're the pastor. You teach us. We can disagree about that. We can disagree on styles of worship. We can disagree if we're supposed to sing off of a wall or sing out of a book. I like singing out of a book. I like singing off of a wall. I like singing in the Spirit. I like singing in English. It doesn't matter to me. I want to lift up Jesus. We can disagree about how we worship. We can disagree about the volume of worship, and many of us do. We can disagree about (laughs) a lot of things. We can disagree about communion. Some people may say, oh my gosh, you have open communion at your church. Any believer is open to having communion. You don't have to be a member of Christian fellowship. There's a lot of people that would disagree with us on that. There's people that would disagree on the methodology of how I baptized Mackenzie Rogolinski this morning. There's disagreements on the words that you use. Do I baptize in the name of Jesus or do I baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? 
Which one is right? We can disagree about that. By the way, if you notice how I do it, I baptize you in the name of Jesus as he commanded in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We just go ahead with one swath. We can disagree about how we take communion. What are the elements? Is it real wine? Is it grape juice? I don't trust you guys with real wine. That's why we don't use it here. Is it a communing, a communal cup? We don't do a communal cup because I'm a germaphobe and I don't want to drink after you, okay? We can disagree over if there is any holiness at all in the prepackaged communion. Or do you need to have the silver tray? Guess what? We do it both ways. I have taken communion from Dixie cups before. And guess what I focused on? We can disagree on that. We can disagree, and I have a lot of disagreements with people. Is a woman allowed to be on the stage? We can disagree with that. We can disagree with who's allowed to preach, who's allowed to administer communion, who's allowed. But I'm telling you, my brothers and my sisters, we cannot disagree on the fact that Jesus himself is God. We must draw that line of unity that Jesus is divine. He is the word. That word there is is logos. He's the spoken word. And God communicates to us through the person of Jesus. He's the living word that was made flesh. It's a reference to Jesus And it's very important we get this as well, that the Word was with God. It's an imperfect tense, and Sarah brought this up in the past. It means that he was face-to-face with God, the Father, not subservient. The the Trinity is co-equal. It's not a hierarchy in the Trinity. It's not God the Father, the the Daddy, and the other two are the kids, and he's telling them what to do. They are co-equal parts of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And to deny the deity of Christ is to deny the clear teachings of Scripture. And it's very important to see not only is he just part of God, Jesus was creator himself. It wasn't that the Father himself was creator. Jesus himself was creator. He said that he was with him in the beginning, and he made everything, and everything was made for him and through him. Jesus himself is creator. I think we've drawn that point. We all agree. Jesus is God. His divinity, it's the first thing I see. Second thing I see is this. It's another doctrine It's his eternality. What does that mean? It it is the pre-existence of the word. Jesus was not only there in the beginning, all things were made through him. So what does that mean? Jesus actually existed before the manger in Bethlehem. Before a way in a manger was ever written about him, you know, no crying he makes. I don't know what baby you had, but that wasn't a good picture of babies, they cry. Thanks, Leslie, for one chuckle. Everybody else like move along. Bethlehem was not the beginning of Jesus. He was there in the beginning. He's the eternally existent one, and it's very important to grasp this because there's a lot of things, tentacles, that that touches. That means that Jesus was not a backup plan that was created after the fall. He was there in the beginning. Jesus was there in the beginning, In John chapter 6, it says, I've come down from heaven. And that means I I was there in the very beginning, before Bethlehem, before the incarnation. And when we think of our own birth, oddly enough, it's my birthday. 47 years old. Richie came into being 47 years ago tonight at 9.01 p.m. There was a cry that shook the earth. It wasn't the same cry in Bethlehem that night, I'll tell you. I had a beginning, and that was my beginning 47 years ago today. But Jesus doesn't have a a birthday. Even though we celebrate it on Christmas, and some of us have a birthday cake for Jesus, happy birthday, Jesus. I want to tell you something. Jesus does not have a birthday. He is the Alpha, and he's the Omega. 
He was there in the beginning and he'll be there in the end. He is the one who was and who is and he's the one who is to come. It's very important that we get this. Now, I get it. I'm not talking against having Jesus a birthday cake, but we need to understand he does not have a beginning. He existed from all of eternity because in the beginning was the Word, and that's who Jesus is. In the beginning, he was continually existing. And this is a concept, guys, that our minds can't wrap around. Eternity. Because we're wrapped up here in the temporal. There's going to be an end to this earth. Do you realize that? And it's going to be replaced with a new heaven and a new earth. That's what the Bible says. And there's time today. The sun rose early this morning, and it's going to set tonight, and this day will be gone. It's how we measure time. But it's very important to get this. Jesus himself spoke our time into existence. He's not confined to our time. He just is. And Jesus was in the beginning. There's no beginning to him. He wasn't wasn't born. It's the intrinsic nature of God. He's eternal. He's God in human flesh. He's the one who was and who is, and he's the one who is to come. If God is present in the Son who preexisted his birth, then God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, all three of them are eternal. That, that they're not something that just popped up. They, they have always existed. And these truths, honestly, guys, they support the titles of God. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. He, he is the Father of eternity. All of these things are also a reference to Jesus. He is a co-equal member of the Trinity. Say his divinity. Say his eternality. Oh, this one is, I mean, all all of them are awesome. But this is something that is so powerful. His incarnation, would you say that with me? Not only was Jesus God... Not only is Jesus God, not only is Jesus eternal, not only was he there in the beginning, but this verse, it, that's when the tears started flowing down my face. The word was made flesh, and he dwelt among us. Jesus came to us to redeem our fallen nature. Trey and I, when we took communion this morning, I prayed something over us. Jesus didn't just come for our weakness. We all have weaknesses. We were utter failures apart from the atoning work of Christ. It's not like, well, this one was a little bit better, so they're a little closer to God. We were utterly estranged from the Father and without hope of Jesus Christ coming to this earth and redeeming mankind. You got to get this. You, You weren't almost there. You're not almost saved. You're either dead or you're alive. There's no middle ground. And we were dead in the wages of our sin apart from Christ. And he came until the word came and dwelt among us. And that light shone in the darkness. And the Bible says it could not overcome it. I want to tell you what that word overcome actually means. It, It couldn't comprehend it. The the light couldn't grasp, it it couldn't fully grasp what was going on. It was the inability to see Jesus for who he is. And I'm telling you, you can read the Bible and see they did not get it. They they didn't understand who he was. Even his dim-witted disciples who he said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, they're going to flog me and scourge me they're going to crucify me and then again i'll raise in three days and it said specifically none of them knew what he was talking about what well, what's that about that they didn't get it they, they couldn't grasp it and verse 10 and 11 backs this up he came into the world the world that was made through him and by him and the world did not even know him to think that the very one that spoke into existence the things that are on this earth, the one that breathed life into every person, they did not know him. I was watching the ceremony the other night. 
I'm not going to get deep in this because I want to keep the focus on Jesus. But I, I had the thought about this. I was watching that and my spirit is grieved. What they were doing, I'll let you define that. But I felt this sickening feeling in my spirit. And, and I told my wife, I said, we're not, we're not going to watch one minute of this. I said, not one minute of these games are we going to watch. I can't say we're focusing on Jesus and then entertain myself with something that's openly mocking him. I'm not going to do that. And that's the decision we made in our home. You do what you see fit. I'm not telling you what to do. But I, I have had this thought, just like that verse Jesus Christ died for every single person on the planet. It brings a fullness to that verse right there. Jesus Christ came to them. They did not even recognize him. Paul himself called himself, I was a persecutor. I was a blasphemer. The question is, do you know Jesus? H have you received Jesus? Christ, this eternally existing God that came to us in human form. Putting this to, uh, together, Christ is co-equal with the Father and he is God. He was there in the beginning. He's the first. He's the last. He, he, he's the eternally existent one. And he came in human flesh to redeem us. Say his incarnation. Next thing I see is his witness, and I, I don't want to spend a whole lot on this because next week we're going to spend a whole lot on the testimony of John the Baptist. By the way, while I'm here, next week, if you want to write this verse down so you can read and discuss with your family and study, we're going to be uh, going from John chapter 1, verse 19 to chapter 1, verse 42. It's a little bit lengthy of a passage. I, I'm sorry, verse 34, not 42. Forgive me for that. John chapter 1, 19 through 34. That'll be next week's passage. But I see his witness in this passage, John's witness. The Bible calls him the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And by the way, guys, I don't know if you realize this or not, today, Consider yourself John the Baptist. That is your precise mission. You are the voice crying out in this world today. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. But I want to tell you, it's not the same entrance that he's going to make that he made when he was saying it. And what I mean by that, when Jesus comes back, we are preparing the way for the soon and returning king to break through that eastern sky and to come and redeem mankind and to take the saints into glory with him. And today we are going into all the world and making disciples of all nations. Why are we doing that? Because the king is coming. The king is coming. Let your voice be heard in the streets. Let it be heard in your homes. Let it be heard in the workplace. Let it be heard every single place you go that the king is coming. I see the witness of this eternally existent God that came to us in human flesh and God sent John the witness, uh, the witness, the baptizer, uh, to be a witness for him. And he was a different kind of guy. Do you realize this? You ever notice that not all Christians are normal? And I be one of them. This dude dressed weird. This dude ate weird things. But he was sent by God to be that one that made straight his paths. And it's our mission today. He didn't bear witness about himself. He bore witness about Jesus. The doctrines I wanted to get through today is that Jesus himself is God. He's divine. We can't disagree on that. We've got to understand that. We've got to set our foundation on that. His eternality, he didn't come 2,024 years ago. That, that is not when Jesus came into being. He was eternally existent. He will be there in the end, the one who was and is and is to come and he was made flesh and dwelt among us. We talked about his incarnation and we see his witness. Who is Jesus? He's God. Who is Jesus? He's the eternally existent one. Who, who is Jesus? He's the, the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. Who is Jesus? He's the one that was bore witness about. Now our second question that I wanted to ask is what do we have because of this? Because John said, 
I'm writing everything in this book so you will know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you can have life in his name. So let's break this passage apart now from the perspective of what do we have because Jesus is who we just talked about. The first thing I see is in verse 9, that you may have light. Say light. This is another very important truth. And you've heard me say this from this pulpit a lot. Without Jesus, you are in darkness. You're lost. Without having Christ as your Savior, I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not a good person. Without having Jesus as your righteousness, you're not a good person. You're straight going on your way, and you will split hell wide open, and that was never made for you. Jesus came that you wouldn't have to spend eternity apart from him. You are in darkness. As a matter of fact, Peter says it this way. He has called us out of that darkness into his marvelous light. Aren't you thankful for that? That the rest of our life doesn't have to be spent in utter darkness He has given us a path. It is receiving the light that has come. The first thing that we have because of who Jesus is in this passage, we have light, but we must make the decision to leave the darkness and go to the light. It's a conscious decision that we make. And here's the truth about God. He will allow you to sit in darkness the rest of your life. He won't violate your will. Now, I will violate the will of my children. We're going to church. I don't want to, Dad. I didn't ask you what you wanted. We're going to church. (laughs) Anybody anybody else parent like that? I, I, I don't know. This is not a parenting sermon, but this is free advice. I feel like that kids have too much reign of the house in today's culture. I never had decision-making ability until I left my parents' house and got married. That's how we parent, by the way. (laughs) You're looking at me like, move along, Richie. Okay, I'll move along. He is not like that. He won't violate your will. God himself is calling you, though, out of darkness. And the truth is, I don't want to sit in utter darkness. But a lot of us choose that intentionally. When we know what God has called us to, we make the conscious decision, I'm going to stay here and we're miserable. There's no happiness apart from Christ. There's no joy apart from Jesus. We know where these paths lead, but we keep walking down those paths. Why? Because we're not ready to go to the light yet, and we know that he's called us to it. We have light. Greg said this one, number two. Would you say with me first, though, we have light. This one is awesome. We have the right to become children of God. Not born of the flesh or of of human will, but born of God. Romans 8, 14, and 15. Turn there with me if you would. says this. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 and 15. All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then we're heirs and heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. Let me tell you what God has made you when you come to the light. You're a child of God. We sang it last week. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. That's good theology because it's straight out of the Bible. That's exactly what we're called to. He is my father. I've been adopted into a family. 
because of the blood of Jesus. Oh, I love that song. His blood runs through my veins. I've been born of the Spirit now. He is my Father. He's not just my Master. He is. He's my Father. And Jesus, I am a joint heir with Him because of what He did. He has adopted me and redeemed me by His blood. All of this is predicated upon Jesus being God in human flesh who came incarnate and redeemed us from the darkness and from ourselves and from our sin. Now we have the right to go to the light and to be children of God. Are you following me this morning? It continues. The third thing that I see we have because of this. Guys, I'm really excited about what we're doing as a church. And I can feel the presence of God in this place today. We have right to behold His glory. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, verse 14, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son. The full glory of the person of Jesus Christ. I want you to think about this. In the Old Testament, God would not let Moses look at him He said, I want to see you. And he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock and I'll put my hand over that. And when I pass by, I'll let you see my back. That was kind of an odd story. But God did it, so hallelujah. I want to tell you what's changed. You now have the capacity to behold him in his glory Oh, when Jesus died on the cross and he said, it is finished to tell us die, what happened? The curtain veil was torn in two from the top, from the bottom, and he said, come on in and behold my glory. Oh, I'm telling you, my friends, God is not withholding his glory from you. He wants you to experience it to the fullest. Oh, man, I came in this place early, and people were already praying. We had a better worship service in practice than we did in church. The Holy Spirit fell in this place. It was awesome in church, but in the practice, I just stood over there with tears weeping down my face, and I'm like, God, I feel your glory. I see you in this place. That is not supposed to happen ever once in a while. Jesus didn't tear the temple veil that every once in a while when you feel like it, God, let me see you. He says, come on in. Come on in. Receive my glory. He said, we have beheld the fullness of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, when the glory would fill the temple, oftentimes it said the priest couldn't even stand to minister. Jesus is the full expression of the glory of God. Mm. Can we just stop? Jesus, let your glory manifest in this place today. Lord, we don't want a sermon. We want the fullness of the glory of the Lord. Jesus, be magnified in this place. Lord, we want to behold you, Lord. And you said, come on in. You tore the veil in too, Lord. And I'm tired of worshiping from afar. When you've called us into the holy place now, Lord, you said, come on in and behold my glory. Jesus, you did that. Hallelujah. How many people are hungry for an experience with the glory of the Lord? Man, let's not take that for granted. He says you can see his glory in the person of Jesus. He's called you out of darkness into light. He's given you the capacity to become a child of God. He says, here's my glory in the person of Jesus. And in verse 16 and 17, we can receive grace upon grace and truth in the person of Jesus. Grace is an amazing thing. 
because it's not what we deserve. A little acronym, it's God's reward at Christ's expense. You get what you didn't deserve. You get all these things we've been talking about. What is that? That's grace. The law condemns us. There's no hope in the law. That's the point he's trying to bring out. He said the law was given through Moses, but now Jesus is here. He, he didn't come to do away with the law because you can't do that. He didn't come to, to do that. He, he fulfilled the law so you and I wouldn't have to be under the law. Two amens that you're not under the law. I'm not judged by the law. I am judged by the grace that comes to me by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's grace upon grace upon grace upon grace throughout all of eternity. The, the greater meaning of that word, it's a constant overflowing gift. It's not just once, one time over and over in your life. It's a constant gift of grace. We are constantly being inundated with the grace of God because of Jesus Christ. Do you realize you're not under wrath anymore? You're not in darkness. You're not condemned. You're, you're not sitting on death row anymore. That which was dead has been brought to life because of the work of Jesus Christ. Whew. Whew. I'm happy today. And it's not just because it's my birthday. We have grace. And furthermore, we have truth. We live in a day and age where there's a lot of truth. And if I can't stand a phrase, I don't want to ever hear it again, it's my truth. Well, that's your truth. This is my truth. What do you think about, I don't care what you think about anything. I care what this says about everything. Too often our metric is, what do you think about this? What do you believe? It doesn't matter what you believe. It matters what the absolute truth of God's word says about it. Your truth, my truth, all of that is irrelevant poppycock. And Rick Driscoll isn't even here to enjoy that word. That's his favorite word. I don't want to talk about my truth. I don't want to talk about your truth. I want to talk about the truth. The Bible says that it's found in the person of Jesus Christ. Right here it says truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And out of Jesus' own words, he says, there's no way to the Father but by him, for he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. Jesus instantaneously closed all doors of every other religion. Guys, I want to expose a lie to you today. All paths don't lead to the same place. Well, we all get out there in the long run. No, no, you don't. Jesus says there's one door, and it's him. The one door is the person of Jesus Christ. He says there are no other doors. Not one person will get to the Father except by me because I am the eternally existent God that was incarnate and came to you and died for your sins. I myself am the door. You don't walk through me, you don't get to him. Jesus' words, not my, and I don't say that ostentatiously or condemningly to other people. I say it in compassion. Run to Jesus as fast as you can. We receive grace and we receive truth. There's one thing that I want to say before we're finished. I have one more point. He has given us, and, and I, don't, I don't want to miss this point. The right to know God. Not just be his children. Not just serve him. Those are awesome things. I do both of those things. I am a son of God. I, I do serve him. 
I don't just behold his glory. I do. I don't just worship him and receive grace. Verse 18 says, nobody's ever seen him who's at the Father's side. The only God has made him known. What does that mean? Not only his glory, God wants us to know him. He's not hiding from you. I think we approach God oftentimes like it's some weird game of hide and go seek. And God is the master hider. And we're spending our life looking for him and we can't find him anywhere. That's not the God you serve. He wants you to know him. I'm not talking about, about him. He invites you into intimacy because of the person of Jesus. It's why I pray that and why I want you to pray this with me every day. Lord, I want to know you more than I did yesterday. Reveal yourself to me. That's not a prayer that God says, nah. He says, yes. That's what I've been waiting for. I want you to pursue me. And the truth is, I know people in this church on multiple levels. Some of you, I don't know your name, your visitors here today. Some of you have been coming for a little bit. I, I know you to some level. I want to know you more. Some of you have been some of my best friends for decades. I know some of you on a social setting. I know some of you in a church setting. I, I, I know some of you in multiple, multiple levels. I know Jenny in a lot better way than I know any of you. That's my wife, by the way. That's a good thing. I need to know my wife more than I know you. Do you realize that? That's why I want to spend time with her. Because I love her. I, w I, I want to be intimate. I want to have an intimate knowledge of everything about her. And what I want you to get to today is more than the intimacy that you have with your spouse. More than the intimacy you have with your homie that you went to kindergarten with and now you're 70 years old. More than the intimacy and the confidant relationship you have with your best friend or with a parent or with a child, God wants you to know him so much more than any of that. Man, to think that that same creator God who just was and is the eternally existent one that came to redeem me doesn't say, okay, now you don't go to hell. Thank God for that. He says, behold my glory and know me. I'll tell you something about relationships. They deepen by pursuit. You can't have an intimate relationship with someone unless you're willing to pursue that. It takes time. It takes investment. It takes priority. Man, I think back to when Jenny and I started dating in that two weeks before we got married. <laughs> A little bit of an embellishment, not much. We dated a week and then I proposed. Why did you do that? Because I'm not a dummy. I didn't want anybody else to get her. I knew there's nobody like her. We dated one week, started dating on Christmas night, year 2000, January the 2nd, 2001. I said, will you marry me? And she said yes for some odd reason. I remember in that season, think about your own marriage early on. It didn't matter what you did. You just had to be together. Am I telling the truth? Don't ever lose that, by the way. It didn't matter. You could shovel manure together, and it was the greatest experience. And I love you so much. It did not matter. Where do you want to eat, babe? Oh, whatever you're hungry for. It doesn't matter. What movie do you want to, do you want to hold the remote? You can hold it. I love you so much. Sure, I love rom-coms. I love Hallmark. Can we spend eight hours watching nothing but that? Please, as long as I can hold your hand. 
And then the phone calls. Hours upon hours upon hours. You're falling asleep. But you could not do the injustice to that person you love of hanging up the phone. I was glad we got married so I could get some sleep. You hang up. You hang up. I love you too much for that. What is that? It's a pursuit and a priority. That's how it's supposed to be with God. But unfortunately, most of the time, we are the very identification of the letter that was written in the book of Revelations. It said, I have this against you. You've lost your first love. You've stopped pursuing me. I remember a time, Richie, that you were on fire for me. That you just wanted to pursue me. The TV didn't matter. You could, you could throw the TV in the yard. It, it didn't matter what was going on. If there was a gathering of other believers, that took precedence because you wanted to experience me in that level. You were there every time the doors were open, every Bible study. You would wake up so willingly and pray for hours in the morning. You would open the Word. I remember those times. Where did you go, my child? Because I can tell you, he's not gone anywhere And he's still right here saying, I want you to know me. Will you pursue me in intimacy again? Will you put me first and say, God, I just want you. Everything else is rubbish, Lord. I count everything else as lost because I want to know you. The all-surpassing worth of knowing you. Why is the church of God in the shape it's in? Because we're not pursuing the God that we say we love and follow. Well, I've been there. I want to tell you something. You can't exhaust knowledge of God. Well, I've had that experience before. Now, his experiences and mercies are new every morning. Who is Jesus in this passage? He's He's God. Simply put, he's equal with God. He's not just the son of God. He is God. He is creator. He was eternally existent. He was the preexistent one. And he's the one that came to us incarnate. And there was witnesses about that. What do we have because of that? We have light. Light. We've been called out of darkness. We're now children. We're not estranged. We're not slaves. We're we're children. We behold its glory. We now receive grace upon grace and truth. And we have the right to know him. That's what I got out of this passage. And like I said, it's just a little flyover. There's so many more nuggets in this, next week we're going to read verses 19 through 34. And I encourage you with your family, read that, study it this week. Take communion together. Let your prayer life be altered. Come early, pray with us before service next Sunday morning. Let's all stand to our feet. As the worship team comes. to close your eyes if you would and focus on Jesus focus on God in the person of Jesus Christ the eternally existent one focus on God who came to us in human flesh incarnate the one that's been witnessed about not only from John from the voices from John and before John and after John that have bore testimony about the person of Christ. He is God, and He has so much in store for you. 
He's calling you out of darkness. He wants to lavish His grace on you. He, he wants to bestow a child relationship with you. He wants to give you grace and truth and let you behold His glory. And He wants you to know Him. I want to lead us in a prayer. I feel like I need to repent. Jesus, I do that publicly. I, I've not pursued that intimate knowledge of you as at times in the past. If I've ever in my life of pastoring this church feel the assurance that we're exactly focusing on what we need to and in the place that we need to be, it's right now. I know that you said now is the time to focus on the person of Jesus Christ more than ever. Lord, I'm trying my best to obey you. Bring us back, Lord. There's a lot of decisions that you'll make in life, but none of them will ever compare to the one decision that matters, and that's what will you do with Jesus. We encourage you to sit down, to calculate the cost, and to make the greatest decision that you could ever make and declare Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you need some counsel or if you need someone to pray with you or if you need more information about what it looks like to be a Christ follower, feel free to call us here at the church at Christian Fellowship at the number at the bottom of your screen. We're here to serve you as we do this thing called life together.